they're distorted, or because they really are difficult. But you can, if you have a lot of them, and you can use statistics. Or if you don't like statistics, you can, if you're lucky, just look at one of these pictures. And here you see, you can, it doesn't take much convincing here, but there is a stretching all the way around of these galaxies. These are galaxies, lots of galaxies. Those galaxies are in the background. There's a big thing here in the middle in the relative foreground. And what you're seeing is just this effect here. There's a magnification in the middle. You can't tell that because it doesn't distort. But you will do tell the distortion effects going around here that stretch these images out into these arcs. So they're not really that shape. It's the lensing. There's something in the middle that is causing that, those galaxies to appear to be stretched out. Beautiful picture. There are others. Let me show you another one here. Um, it's not quite so evident as this one. When you look at it for a bit, you can see there is a sort of same sort of effect stretching out like this. Even more striking are things like this. Three arcs, but well not sometimes. This is not quite true. Almost. <laughs> There's something almost dead in the line of sight through the gravitating body, which distorts some distant image into this huge arc like this. It's not that shape. That doesn't make sense dynamically. It's not that shape, but it looks that shape, purely because of this vial curvature that you're looking at. So you're seeing the vial curvature. You look through this distorting lens, and that distorting lens is the vial curvature. So that's it. That's the bar curvature. Now the bar curvature hypothesis, which is what I'm making here, an assumption about what the Big Bang is like, is that the bar curvature is zero uh, at the beginning, or something like that. And this is an absolutely huge constraint on the initial state. How small is the region in phase space as compared to the whole space? which represents the Big Bang. Something like this. One part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 123, or maybe 124, depends on the dark matter into consideration. This is an absolutely stupendous number. Suppose you want to write this out, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, just like that, with all the zeros. Well, and you want to put a zero on each proton in the observable universe. It's not nearly enough work giving you some idea of how special that initial state was. It's extraordinarily special. So any theory which is going to explain that, be it quantum gravity or whatever, has got to explain its incredible precision. And not any conventional approach, approach to quantum gravity gets anything like this. I don't know that it gets anywhere at all, actually, with regard to this problem. So we don't know. But I want to give you some suggestions. And this is the first suggestion, is how do we characterize this in a different way. I've been talking about the vial curvature, but I could have done this without even mentioning the vial curvature in another way, which is a procedure that has been exploited particularly by my colleague Paul Tom, who has done the following. He says, well, let's pretend that we're interested not in the space-time metric, but just its conformal structure. Now, what does that mean? Um, in fact, you see, we can go close to the Big Bang, and as we go close to the Big Bang, we find that energies go up and up and up, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and that the mass of individual particles becomes irrelevant as you get close to the Big Bang. What does that mean? Well, you can't build a clock, is what it really means. What do I do if I say you can't build a clock? Well, because clocks ultimately depend on mass. And so, I'm going to use here one of the few, or two of the few formulae that I'm using. First of all, the famous flat formula, which I referred to before, E equals H mu. That means the colors of the energy of a particle is in proportion to its frequency. It has a frequency which is proportional to its energy. And Einstein's famous E equals mc squared, which tells us the energy is proportional to its mass. You put the two together, and you see that the frequency, um, the frequency and the mass are in strict proportion. So if you have a massive particle, it naturally has a frequency. It's, sort of, it's, a, it's like a clock. It has a natural frequency, depending on its mass. Now, 
uh, there are nowadays very accurate <coughs> atomic and nuclear clocks. They don't involve single particles, but the basic idea is the same. You have lots of clocks, lots of particles for stability reasons, but the ultimate reason for the being precise of the clocks comes down to ultimately mass. I think that's a fair comment. Now, the thing about mass is that it gives a scale, but it's not present in just the light. So, clocks and relativity, well, the metric, this is often written GAD or GIK or GMU or something like that, is a thing which has ten components at each point, ten numbers to characterize it. Nine of those are simply telling you where the light cone is. One tells you the scale. So, if you have two clocks whizzing by, or identical clocks, they're ticking away, this is the first tick, the second, the third, and these different clocks that whiz by, you see these different surfaces that represent the clock ticks. That's the clocks that whizzing by. Now, uh, I want to return to this diagram here, where we had the light cones. This is really only a partial description of space-time geometry, because I didn't put these cones in, uh, these surfaces in. I should put them in to give you the clock threads. And then, this is a better description of general relativity, or sort of a consent, complete one, of relativity. This tells you what the metric is. But if I just want what's called a conformal metric, I go back to the light cones. And there's much, many parts of physics are responsive only to the conformal metric. And in fact, electromagnetism or massless particles, for instance, photons only respond to the light currents. So you have to think of the photon going along there, and it doesn't even reach the first tick, you see. The photon just zips along, and it, it doesn't tick at all. OK, that will be important in a moment. Uh, but here we have the claim now that as you get near to the Big Bang, the geometry that's important is conformal geometry. In this relativity concept, context, it means just light coming up. But let me remind you of this edge picture which we had before. It's really this same idea, but in a sense in reverse. I'm representing this whole space, now called as conformal space. Remember here, this conformal geometry a boundary which represents infinity. Here we have a boundary which represents the Big Bang. And Todd's trick is to say, let's suppose you can do this such that this is a nice smooth boundary and you can imagine stepping onto the other side. This is a purely fictional space on this side, but it's a way of characterizing the special nature of the Big Bang. Very beautiful idea. It tells you, uh, without mentioning a wild answer if you like, at all, it just says this light kind of geometry, or formal geometry, continues smoothly to some imaginary space down here. The real space that we know is here. But is it imaginary space? You see, the particles don't know where this line is at all, because they just know the formal geometry. You assume that energies get so high that the masses become irrelevant, and it's reasonable to assume that all the forces between the particles, the particle force physics, is conform and invariant. Assumption, it's a reasonable assumption. And this tells us, as far as the physics is concerned in here, it doesn't even know where that big bang is. It's a funny idea, but let's uh, consider that. Now I want to talk about the other end of the universe, the remote future. Think about the extremely remote future. What happens in the remote future? Well, uh, now a lot of matter will go into black holes. Perhaps most of it will. Eventually, the expanding universe could cool so lower than the whole Hawking temperature. I haven't said what the Hawking temperature is, but let me give you a picture of that. What the black holes do if you leave them alone? Well, here we have a similar picture of before. The matter collapses, and then you have to leave it for an incredibly long amount of time. Well, you see the collapse of a black hole of about the solar mass would take 10 to 64 years before it does what Hawking tells us. It cools down first. To, the universe cools down to first to less than the temperature that the black hole has, so it's a very cold temperature according to Hawking. When the universe gets colder than that, it radiates away.